interesting and there might be a slight delay while this all gets started but I'm really excited to have anyone out there joining me here on our boat, our home in Indonesia just outside the Komodo Islands. So I'm going to just do a little bit of general chatting to start because it might take people a while to join in. Um, good morning to everyone joining me from the UK and here in Indonesia it's five o'clock in the afternoon and anyone out in the South Pacific it's far later still so um, welcome any of you there. Uh, this is our boat home, it's been home to me and my husband and our growing family for the last eight and a half years, uh, and longer than that actually, um, and we're currently bobbing about at anchor in um, the harbour of Labuan Bajo in Komodo uh, off the main island of Flores in Indonesia. Um, so uh, apologies if there are any problems with signal or delay, I am just at the mercy of my <laughs> computer system run by an iPhone. Uh, but that's that's kind of the way of, of boating and that's what life is like on board. So um, yeah, if you guys um, want to chime in at any point with any questions, I can see messages ping up here on my screen at any point. And other than that, I will just be waffling on and telling you about um, our floating life. I'll get into it in a moment, but I'm going to allow us about five minutes of uh, just general chit chat uh, while people get logged in and set up. So I hope that's OK with you all. If you'd like to tell me where you're logging in from, that'd be great. Um, those of you who've never heard of me, um, that's OK. I'm not a huge name in, in the sailing world. Um, you might um, have heard my name pop up if you are a reader of Sailing Today magazine in the UK. I've been writing a column for them for the last five years. It's um, a column called Blue Note and that's generally um, uh, topics on all aspects of sailing life uh, that uh, I've sort of um, drawn together from all the different countries we've visited over our, over our passage so far over the last nearly nine years. Um, and uh, in the briefest way, I can say that our, our cruising experience has been we've sailed, set out from England in 2011 and sailed uh, a bit in Europe and then uh, across the Atlantic, had about a year in the Caribbean and um, then ducked down to Panama, um, further south in the Caribbean and decided to start a family. Hello, I've got someone there from Greece. That's lovely. Um, and... Um, uh, decided not to cross the Pacific Ocean straight away with our first pregnancy, but had our daughter up in Mexico. So from Panama, uh, we <laughs> decided to sail two and a half thousand miles against wind and current in order to have a baby in Mexico, which was an experience in itself. Um, and then we crossed the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Atlantic, the Pacific Ocean with her uh, when she was eight, eight months old and spent um, quite some time in the Pacific and uh, then ducked down to New Zealand for cyclone season and um, had another baby there and then uh, set out as a family of four um, some while later and back out into the Pacific and then on to Southeast Asia and um, then had yet another baby on a flying trip back to the UK. Um, and as well as writing for Sailing Today and a number of different sailing magazines you guys probably know, like um, Yachting Monthly, Yachting World, um, Ocean Navigator, Cruising Helmsman, um, I, uh, I'm also working on an exciting project um, in association with the Royal um, Cruising Club Pilotage Foundation. Um, so they work with Imre on a number of publications and this chap here is the current thing that I'm working on. South Pacific Anchorages was last revised by Warwick Clay and I think that was last out in um, 2000 and, uh, 2001, um, so really quite some time ago. And obviously the, the land masses themselves in, in the Pacific don't change an awful lot, but rules and regulations do, um, particularly when it comes to welcoming cruisers and different places you're allowed to anchor. Um, but also the main thing that's changed is the way in which we get information across. So if I can um, 
give you a glimpse of the previous edition, um, which, you know, is still an incredibly useful guide. But it's entirely black and white, and a lot of the anchorage is just have little sort of sketch charts. I'll show you a little bit here. Um, and really, um, the way that cruising guides have come up and the access that we have to um, the technology that gives us really accurate satellite imagery and really accurate charting, um, it's just come on in, in huge, huge leaps and bounds since publications like this came out. So my job is to go through the entire South Pacific and um, a bit by bit, piece by piece, and um, work with a huge number of other cruisers who are out there um, in the field, as it were, um, getting them to verify information, getting them to um, pass on images that we can use. Um, we're now working with drone imagery, which is super helpful um, if you're coming through a reef pass somewhere in the South Pacific, for example. Um, it really doesn't help just having a chart. It's it's so useful to actually see those colours of, of the reef and, and see what the topography and the landmass is. Um, basically, the more information you can have on an area, the better, particularly when you're in really remote parts. So the South Pacific does indeed cover everything from the Galapagos in the east all the way through to Papua New Guinea in the west. We're going as far down as the um, North Island of New Zealand, even covering a little bit of the top of the South Island of New Zealand, and also going all the way up to the Marshalls, Micronesia um, in the north. So it's a really, really huge area of coverage, um, which is great. It's exciting. It's, um, it's something that's also quite tricky to work on at the moment, um, as you may or may not be aware with um, the whole COVID situation. Uh, there are new restrictions popping up everywhere, not just for the short term, but some which will affect cruisers in the long term. So there's, there, yeah, there's, there's a lot of challenges ahead, um, particularly in, in this area. So uh, the reason that this talk is titled um, Juggling Parenting with Politics in the Pandemic is because that's pretty much how my everyday goes. I have three young children who are six years old and four years old and a year and a half. And we live in a 42 foot home uh, full time. And uh, we're currently dealing with what the restrictions and regulations are in Indonesia. We've already overstayed our visa by two and a half months, um, perfectly legally, we're allowed to. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, that in itself was a bit hairy at times, um, not quite knowing if we were going to be forced to repatriate um, back to the UK or um, if we'd be allowed to stay here and cruise around or if we'd be allowed to stay here and um, have a restriction of staying completely put in, in one place. Um, and and then <laughs> all the while I'm, I'm also <laughs> carrying on my work on, uh, on revising this title. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the kind of everyday challenge that, that I'm facing. But that is no strange thing with cruising. You know, I think we all learn with having a boat that um, there are a number of unforeseen challenges and there are a number of things that you have to suddenly learn to be good at all at once that you wow. weren't necessarily familiar with before. So um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's basically a bit about me. Um, I would love it if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask um, about any aspect of things that I've only just briefly done in an intro there. Um, I've got someone asking about once lockdown is lifted, where are you heading to next? That is, a, hmm, that's a good question. So um, like any good sailor, we don't just have a plan A. We always have a plan A, B, C and D. Um, in the same way that if you're working out pilotage to go somewhere, you should really have ports of refuge worked out and things like that. Um, initially, our uh, main plan was that after some time in Indonesia, which we were expecting to be coming to an end now, we would be using the southeast monsoon season, the good winds, for um, heading back west towards uh, Lombok and Bali, and then um, sailing up towards uh, Malaysia, that towards Singapore and Malaysia. From Bali to Singapore is roughly a thousand nautical miles. Um, and we were planning on having the next season in Malaysia and Thailand. Currently, the uh, cruising restrictions, well, the international border restrictions in Malaysia are hoping that they will reopen borders at the end of August. 
Now, the southeast monsoon season only runs until the end of September. So attempting the passage north from Bali after the end of September is relatively unwise. So it's after that point that our plan A has to turn into something else. We didn't originally have plans to sail to, um, let's see, our nearest neighbouring country being Australia. Uh, we didn't have any plans to sail there, but if the weather um, is against us, but um, things are opening up in terms of immigration, it might be something we have to consider. Um, and uh, someone I know is saying that she's excited that I mentioned the Galapagos Islands. Yeah, the Galapagos Islands are really exciting. They are a big um, sort of, it's, it's one of the big challenges you face when you're setting out across the South Pacific, because a lot of people, when they're new to cruising, um, think, great, I can go anywhere I like. That's brilliant. But that's not really the reality of sailing, it's especially not um, full time, especially not when you're dealing with an area that is subject to cyclones and tropical storms. Um, when you're setting out across the Pacific from, say, somewhere along the coast of anywhere in the Pacific Americas, um, you'll be working out a route through. And the Galapagos is one of those destinations that people have always dreamt about, right? You know, we've seen the David Attenborough programs and, uh, you know, it's, it's a dream place for a lot of people. Unfortunately, on a private boat, it's very, very expensive. And there are um, quite rigid um, uh, rules in force about where you can and can't anchor and um, where, you, um, where you can enter, places that are totally off limits. And there are, of course, the financial um, things to consider because you can go to certain places, but you have to pay for it quite a lot. So that's part of what I'm doing with this new guide. I have to make sure that these things are up to date so that people can make an informed choice about it. You know, by all means, people still go into the Galapagos and they're wonderful. And to get the full value of going there, it's really good to understand um, under what circumstances and conditions you're able to go there. Um, how much time you're allowed to spend. You know, if you find that really you can only have a maximum of 30 days, then fair enough. How do you use those 30 days in the best possible way? Because it is very much a, a once in a lifetime type expedition. Um, so, uh, yeah, someone else is saying, you know, how do you go about updating a guide that covers such a large area? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's. At, at first, it's, it was a little bit daunting, but I, um, having sailed across the Pacific myself, um, I know what I would like to see in a guide, in that I know that for the areas that we went, um, the places that we were able to get information from and the information that I felt was lacking. Um, and obviously, I haven't travelled myself everywhere in the South Pacific. No one could. Oh, it would be amazing if we could, but there's not enough life <laughs> but um there's uh um there's a great thing about um using cruising guides every day you become very familiar with how to you know quickly reference them so because you're never sitting down and reading the whole thing in its entirety um it's quite easy to break it down area by area so that's just how i'm working on it you know it won't necessarily be in um, uh, sort of, you know, topographical order, as it were. Um, you know, I've been working on a certain section of French Polynesia very recently, and I've been combining that with working on North Island New Zealand, um, as well as working on Vanuatu. So it's um, just breaking down each area into bits. And when I get to a certain sort of stopping point in one bit, well, you know, I can just put that on hold and then work on another area. Um, so, oh, OK, I've got a question about which areas of the pilot are you particularly excited about exploring? Um, it's quite hard to be in Southeast Asia writing about an area that you, you know well and that is you know, maybe featuring some of your favourite anchorages. I'm not going to lie, when I have to go through um, our own photographs or photographs that come in from other cruisers, um, it does sometimes pull at the heartstrings. <laughs> And, and kind of make me go, oh, yeah, it would be great to go back there. And so much so that, you know, if plan A and plan B don't work, it might be that plan C involves going back to the South Pacific. Um, but areas that, you know, we've loved, um, you can't talk about the South Pacific without talking about French Polynesia because it's so 
um, latitudinous. It's it's so varied. It has you know these five different island groups, these five clusters, and you know even with that within that they're also different and so varied. Um, having said that, you know I also adore Fiji. Um, we never made it to the Lao group, and I would love to return to Fiji in order to spend proper amount of time there. Um, and uh, you know, I, I also like the sort of unsung heroes of, of the South Pacific. We spent some amazing time in the outer islands of Papua New Guinea in, in places where there's, you know, maybe one boat that visitors, uh, visits these islands every six months. And we're talking about islands where there's no roads, no shops, no currency. And you're dealing entirely with barter and trading goods. And it's a completely different way of life. And I think sometimes, you know, that's what we seek when we go out sailing, something that's you know, completely extraordinary and, and other, otherworldly to our, um, uh, to the things that we, we deal with, you know, wherever back home is. Um, so uh, I've got a question that I pinned here. Someone asked about um, money, which is, you know, it's fine to ask about money. Uh, do you think a couple could live an okay cruising life on 2,500 US dollars a month on a 37 foot sailing boat? Um, I think, okay. Uh, really simple answer, yes. <laughs> yes, of course, because you can make anything work, ultimately. I mean, it's it's a sort of open-ended question, it's an open-ended answer. I'm sorry that's, if it's not satisfactory, but um, if you think about the payoff for, you know, what you get for what you do, um, it's perfectly possible, depending on where you want to go cruising, um, it's perfectly per possible to live at anchor, you know, not having to pay any mooring fees, you know, we haven't tied up to a marina since we left New Zealand in ooh, 2016, in June 2016. So, yeah, that's you know, quite a while. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, it, you might be in areas where, okay, maybe there, there aren't marinas, but there are mooring balls, but that's likely to be substantially cheaper. Um, but, yeah, so living at anchor is primarily the, the main way that you can live very cheaply. And also, uh, you know, doing all your cooking on board. Uh, so it very much depends on which part of the world you're planning on cruising in. Um, and certainly as a couple, I mean, you know, we, we have three kids and, and we're sailing on less than that. So, yeah, I, I think you'd be absolutely fine. It's just a ca case of money management. We um, make a record of absolutely everything that we spend. And we have done that throughout the journey so far. And that really helps. You know, it makes you sort of um, see at a glance, you know, on balance, which countries are more expensive for things like visas, for things like um, diesel. You know, we'd love to be able to sail absolutely everywhere, but of course we do have diesel costs. Sometimes you have water costs as well. We don't have a water maker, but we do carry a large amount of water on board. Um, so yeah, things like that. It will very much depend on your cruising area. Um, okay, so let's see what some of the other questions I've had here. Um, how do you cope with the practicalities of shopping for food while isolated during a pandemic? Well, Indonesia is not officially on lockdown. Um, Areas of it are, but we're talking about a country which um, consists of over 17,000 islands. So um, although there is a national ruling about certain aspects of um, things related to the pandemic, the um, individual islands have their own rules about movement and things like that. Uh, mainly what we're doing is what we feel comfortable with um, in that, you know, one of us goes ashore wearing a mask um, and goes for supplies roughly once a week. And um, they have taken things very seriously here in Labu and Bajo. Um, before you enter um, a supermarket, you have to wash your hands, you have to be wearing a mask. Uh, before you use a cash machine, you have to be washing your hands. Um, so yeah, and those things have been in place for a, a number of months. Um, actually before, I, I think easily three months. So before some of those measures even came into place in, in the UK. Um, so yeah, we're just we're, we're doing that, which is something that we're comfortable with, and we're just sort of um, limiting the contact that we have with with people to a certain extent. There are certain people that we socialise with that we've uh, been in touch with for quite some time before we were even willing to you know shake hands with them. Um, but yeah, um, so shopping for supplies isn't isn't a problem here at the moment at all. Oh, are you planning a Pacific circuit? <laughs> well, plans are. Um, what do they say? A sailor's plans are written in the sand at low tide. Plans are always changeable. Um, who knows? Who knows? Uh, yeah, we really don't know. I mean, I, I do think that we're probably unlikely to continue westwards after Malaysia, Thailand, but that doesn't mean that we won't continue eastwards. But uh, who, who knows? Who knows? I, I like to always keep my options open as, as far as that goes. 
Um, and someone else asked, uh, do you have family and friends fly out to wherever you may be and cruise with you? I'm thinking long distance babysitters. Well, we've had sort of a variety of that. Um, first, it was quite hard to pin us down because we were on the go so much. Um, and the easiest way for friends and family to come and um, visit us was um, during cyclone seasons because obviously the boat would be roughly in one spot for quite some time. Um, uh, but we've had people who uh, are able to fly out last minute and we've had people visit us in, in the Caribbean, in, in Mexico, in New Zealand. Um, also, we, uh, we've picked up um, crew for certain passages along the way. We had someone um, that we met in French Polynesia and we sort of didn't really think we needed crew and we thought we'd test out how that went. Uh, so we, we agreed to take him to the next island. And um, five months later, he, he left us in, in Fiji. So that worked wonderfully. And we were fortunate enough that um, that, that guy was also willing to come and um, do another leg with us all the way to Indonesia. So he was, he was, he was crew and, and friend and, you know, sometime babysitter. And uh, we, we've been very lucky to have him in our lives and, uh, and for the children to, to experience that as well. So, yeah, so uh, we've also had um, crew for... Um, just sort of straight passages. We had someone um, help us from Fiji to New Zealand uh, because uh, at that point I actually flew. Uh, I was heavily pregnant at the time, so um, I, I wasn't going to be that helpful on night watch. And I also had a, a little one who I was still nursing. So um, yeah, we kind of we balance it with what feels right according to the season. And um, sometimes they're they're visiting family friends, and sometimes it's it's crew members. So. Um, and another question of what the kids like to do to occupy them on long passages. Um, a bit of everything, really. Um, sometimes, uh, I mean, they've grown up on a boat. So <laughs> sometimes they like to come up and experience the journey with us. Sometimes they're just so used to it because it's their home. They'll be, you know, down here in the saloon drawing or um, making things out of Lego or, or looking at books or... Um, you know, they might just have a really long nap if it's just a, a, a day passage. Um, long ones, uh, I suppose that, I mean, the longest one we did was with Rocket when she was eight, month, eight months old. That was the 26 day crossing from Mexico to the Marquesas. And, you know, she was too little to occupy herself. Um, so, but also, you know, she kept us occupied. It was, it was quite a, a nice thing to have, uh, you know, to share an ocean crossing with a little one. She learned to crawl on that passage. Um, nowadays, um, you know, with three that are so little and because of the cruising area that we're in, you know, Indonesia is littered with islands. So you, you couldn't possibly visit all of them. Um, so we tend to do um, hops, day hops. And if, if we have to do longer passages, we might plan it for an overnighter so that um, the kids are down and I can you know, participate more with night watch and, and things. Um, or, you know, we might decide to do it as a, as a long day to get in before the light fails us. Um, so, yeah, again, it, it varies a lot. It depends on the type of passage that, that we're doing. Um, I'm just going to have a sip of... Uh, I'm still very British. You know, I've got to have my afternoon tea. And it's actually quite late for tea. It's half past five now. Well, so I suppose, yeah, the biggest thing is um, just learning to be flexible. That's something you have to learn as a sailor. And, you know, you have to. And it's something you have to learn as a parent. And um, I, we quite often realised that um, when we started off sailing, it was just the two of us. You know, it was it was a choice that we made and something that you know we really enjoyed. And we're so lucky that the kids are able to participate in it at all and that they enjoy it. But equally, you know, if if they're not feeling like it one day, or you know, if if we um, have ideas about going to a certain place we discuss everything with them and if if they're not keen on an idea you know we have to always consider that their their voices are valid and we're not going to kind of drag them around with us so it's yeah i think it's really important to um to allow them to have a voice because the choice was never theirs to go sailing in the first place so um but fortunately, they do seem to really enjoy it, and they don't suffer from seasickness. I myself do suffer from seasickness, so if there's anyone out there who who does get seasick and they think, "Oh, I could never go on a boat," or if there's you know um, someone a partnership where you know your husband or your wife gets gets seasick and you want a boat, 
there is hope. There's definitely hope because I've been, you know, three quarters of the way around the world and I still get seasick. It tends to be worse if you're um, pregnant or breastfeeding. So that's that's been me for most of my trips so far. Um, but it has to be said that full time cruising doesn't mean full time being on passage. You know, um, we do spend an awful lot of time enjoying ourselves at anchor and you know going to beaches and exploring cities and towns and villages and getting to know people and um yeah there's a the sailing although it's a wonderful part of it it's also a relatively small part of it in terms of if you do have an affliction like seasickness um yeah one of the other things we've been doing in, in the pandemic at the moment because everything's slowed down and we're sort of staying in a relatively small um cruising area um we've been cleaning up beaches that's a great thing for the kids to learn. You know, we've been taking trash bags ashore and, you know, there certainly is more of a, a rubbish and waste issue in Southeast Asia than there was anywhere across the Pacific that, that I can remember. Um, so, you know, but that's a great first hand experience. It's, it's educating all of us about, you know, what we consume and what we throw away. Um, but also it's making the beach that bit nicer for the next people who come and visit. So, you know, it's a, it's a win win situation. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you a few things around our home. The light is starting to fail, so I might have to um, put some lights on because it does get dark here uh, about six o'clock. But just to give you a nice little visual aid, this globe in our main saloon, I'll just see if you can see it there. Okay, so this, you might be able to see just about that there's a little, where is it, little sharpie marker line running along our entire route so far. So um, this isn't how we navigate, by the way. <laughs> but that might give you a little bit of an idea of uh, where we've been so far. There we go. The big diversions are for cyclone seasons and um, having babies. <laughs> so there you go. Right, what's the biggest challenge you've come across so far? It's an interesting one because people tend to always ask the um, the same sorts of questions about um, have you come across any pirates or um, have you been in any big storms? And we love a bit of drama, don't we, as human beings? I wonder why that is. <laughs> um, the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge for me personally has probably been having to let go of the helm a bit because naturally having the kids and um, you know things like breastfeeding you know having to be there for them in the night um, and even having to make the hard decision at certain points um, to to leave the boat for a particular passage to take place um, you know that's quite hard when it's a decision we made together to sail and um, you know we, we were in it equally um, James my husband is very much the skipper you know we made the decision very early on that there can only be one skipper because it helps you get through any stalemate, you know, um, if there has to be someone who has the final word. Uh, I, I might voice an opinion uh, to the contrary, but if he says we're going to do this, then, you know, that that's how it goes. And, um, you know, I fully support that. Um, but, yeah, so it's, it's quite tough to go from being um, such a great team and such a great partnership um, and knowing how magical it feels on Nightwatch with billions of stars above you and you know dolphins playing in the phosphorescent water um to to sort of going okay yeah i i can't be on night watch now i have to be down below with with the kids but it's not always like that you know sometimes the conditions allow that i can have a baby strapped to me and still um you know uh, do a night watch passage and it's great um so probably for me personally that one of the biggest challenges was um was that and Probably for us as all together, um, one of the biggest challenges, I suppose overall, it's um, just a general feeling of, of getting used to sort of rolling with the punches, that um, things do break, you know, it's it's a working machine, it's like, um, it's, a, it's a home, but it's also like a home combined with a car and it's put into a very aggressive environment. You know, salt water corrodes things and, you know, things do break, nothing lasts forever. So you have to not let any of those um, breakages or failures um, 
they can't take an emotional toll on you because it's only up to you to mend things. I mean, sure, you might be in an area which has lots of um, yacht repairs and yacht services, and that's fantastic if you are, but, it, you know, chances are where we've been sailing, you might not, you know, remote outer atolls of Papua New Guinea, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> there's, no, there's not a yachting culture there. Um, so, yeah, a, a question, that uh, have you had any unexpected big boat repairs in isolated remote areas? Well, um, uh, we've been a combination of, of lucky and smart, I'd say. Um, we timed certain uh, repairs. I mean, you know, you have to keep an eye on everything in a boat. You have to maintain things as well. So hopefully that alerts you to potential problems before they actually pop up. Um, so when you are in areas which are full of yacht services, so I think of you know our time in Mexico, I think of our time in New Zealand, um, you know you can tackle some big jobs um, that you think things might be popping up. You can tackle them there. Uh, but of course, yeah, there are there are things in remote spots. Nothing too bad for us. We had um, we had to replace the um, packing gland. Um, uh, the packing material in our stern gland uh, because we tightened it to the point that it, it wouldn't tighten anymore and it was starting to leak so that it wasn't sealing the shaft um, fully um, and ideally that's something that has to be done when you're hauled out of the water so where we were when we realized you know this was starting to leak you know it's meant to have a steady drip that's that's how a healthy stern gland looks um, this was having more than that, a considerable amount more, not, you know, full sprung leak, but something that we had to do something about. Uh, but we were literally hundreds of miles in either direction from any reliable haul out. And this was in Indonesia. Um, and uh, we ended up pulling into, um, pulling behind a reef. We spent about a week in an area and um, it was a place with incredibly strong currents and uh, James was having to sort of dive down, free dive and uh, tackle this thing in stages, which of course meant disabling the engine uh, for a certain amount of time, which I'm never happy with at anchor. Mm. Um, and at this point we had two little ones and uh, yes, I must have been pregnant with our, our third as well. Um, and it was an area where they, they never really had any tourists. So to go ashore, we would just get mobbed by um, by very friendly but you know, slightly overly friendly um, <laughs> Indonesian villagers and they would swim out to the boat and you know want to clamber all over the boat and um, that's fine to an extent as well um, you know we welcome that that's why we travel but um, it, you can't really progress a job which needs the brains of two of you to uh, to handle <laughs> you're in circumstances like that so yeah that's probably the gnarliest one not in terms of it being um, a particularly big repair but in terms of it something being something that you really don't want to do in the water. Fortunately, we were able to work out um, a way of doing it completely safely in the water, and it did get resolved, and you know, no leaks, and, and we're absolutely fine, and we haven't actually had to haul since then. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't the uh, easiest night's sleep, I'll tell you. Um, and someone's asked, can you ever imagine being properly settled back ashore again? It's an interesting one. Um, we do get asked about, you know, are we sort of settling down at, at any point um of course i mean in some ways we we are completely settled you know this boat home is the only home our kids have ever known um and yeah it's, it's been a very good home to all of us for for nearly nine years um but uh yeah uh, boat life won't last forever for us although i think the the ocean is always going to be a large part of it um so yeah there's there's uh, options open to us but i don't think it's going to be going back to london and um you know kind of getting a, a normal job i think that that ship has sailed really um as luck would have it and um, because our our eldest our daughter was born in mexico she's a mexican citizen so it makes it a bit easier for us to purchase property out there um and also, we've never visited South America. That's somewhere that's uh, on our list. So, um, yeah, there might be um, things like that that happen down the line. But um, yeah, we're not 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 entirely sure as yet. Um, I'm going to turn my back on you all for a moment because I, I, it's getting really dark here. I'm going to see what happens if I turn this light on. It's a bit easier here. And I'm going to leave you entirely to turn on another saloon light. So please excuse me for a moment. Okay. 
Ah, oh, that's a bit better. Um, yeah, so it's it's a funny one because obviously uh, what the future holds for a lot of us is, is very uncertain. And in some ways um, we are very aware of the fact that we've had it easier than a lot of people living in homes during this whole um, pandemic situation because it's relatively easy to isolate on a sailboat, particularly living at anchor. And um, life hasn't actually had to change for us uh, too drastically, which is sort of even more surreal and spooky in a lot of ways because um, obviously it's changing uh, in so many ways for, for so many so many people and you know we, we realize how incredibly fortunate we are. But also the situation is changing all the time. Um, uh, as I said, part of the reason for us staying put in Indonesia is that we don't really quite know how things are going to go here. I mean, you know, how can you? No one does. Um, so part of not wanting to travel around, um, they they have banned inter-island travel here anyway. So from the um, area that, you know, uh, the Boon Badger and Flores are in, uh, there's a limited area that we're allowed to sail around in, in comfortably, but um, the Komodo National Park well, remains shut. And, um, you know, we also need to bear in mind that we are visitors in the country, so we need to be very respectful um, and, and play by the rules, even if the rules, you know, are shifting all the time. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one because uh, as we we're talking about plan A, plan B, plan C, I think all of us just need to be kind of flexible that the future might not look how we thought it might. And, um, you know, we may be forced to sell the boat sooner than we might have thought we would, or we might end up staying on her another five years. I mean, we, we really don't know. Um, ultimately, all you can do as a sailor and as a parent is to make what feels like the right decision for your family then and now. And, you know, that might well change. It's... It's a strange one because um, obviously with a movable home, uh, with something like this happening, you sort of think, okay, well, we could <laughs> we, we could run to somewhere. Uh, no, I mean, it's a boat that goes five miles an hour on a good day, so not really run, sort of lope, I suppose. <laughs> but, um, you know, there is always the option that if, if things uh, get uncomfortable here, then we could move the boat to somewhere else and, um, and quarantine there. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. It all remains a bit... Um, remains a bit open-ended. So um, I might talk a little bit more about the um, South Pacific before uh, before perhaps you've all got tired of me waffling on, I don't know. <laughs> um, so um, this new version of the guide is a really interesting um, process because it's so much about community. As I said earlier, I haven't been to every anchorage in the South Pacific. I would love that, but I don't think there are enough um, years in, in any of our lives for that to be possible. Um, and so in order to write and revise a guide like this, obviously I'm very fortunate to be working with the information I already have from the uh, edition that Warwick Clay came out with back in 2001. Um, but also there's, um, there's a community of many, 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 many willing and experienced sailors out there who um, I've been fortunate that I reach out to them and they respond to me. So it's really a, a great collaborative effort. I'm in touch regularly with about 60 different boats um, spread all across the South Pacific and boats that have traveled through and you know people who are now living on land um, and people who were hoping to set out for the South Pacific this year. Um, and that's that's a sort of double-edged sword at the moment because it's it's a wonderful thing to be in touch with so many people and um, it's also quite heartbreaking to be aware firsthand of um, the, some of the hardships against boats that are in the South Pacific at the moment, boats who were trying to get there. Um, you know, some of the current restrictions in French Polynesia are um, very tricky to navigate. Um, there was, before COVID was even an issue there was already a lot of um, new anchoring restriction coming into place in places like the Society Islands so places like Bora Bora and um, Tahiti and in um, smaller places the Tuamotu archipelago 
mainly with a view to protecting the marine environment, which is something that all sailors are in favour of, you know, looking after the coral, um, making sure your anchors don't damage the coral, and, um, and also respecting the, the local community, both the resident cruisers and um, land residents, because, you know, people don't necessarily want a huge flotilla of sailboats outside at their front door, which is completely understandable. Um, excuse me. Um, and, and before the issue with COVID um, came about, you know, there were a number of um, things in place that were working towards uh, making a bit clearer these, these regulations. But obviously, you now have boats who are um, stuck in French Polynesia for uh, an undetermined amount of time. So that's, um, that's quite tricky uh, to deal with. Um, fortunately, there's um, an organisation called the AVP, which is the Association des Voiliers en Polynésie, the Association of sail Sailors and um, Sailboats in Polynesia. And um, they have really been campaigning on behalf of visiting cruisers, the ones who want to, you know, just go through in one season, the ones who want to linger on in French Pol Polynesia. And, um, but they're also resident there, so they're working with what local residents want in order to make everyone happy, really. Um, so they they are up against quite a tough challenge at the moment because it's uh, no one really knows uh, what the situation will be in French Polynesia and um, whether you'll still be able to anchor in places like Bora Bora where they've been introducing more and more um, fixed moorings. So it's uh, it's it's a strange one, um, and that's why I say that you know sailors always need to be flexible and you know it's something that we learn as parents as well because. We have to sort of roll with the punches. We can't um, just look back to guys like this and sort of say, oh, well, you know, we used to be able to go here and here and here and here. You know, that's great. And, you know, of course, we would love to be able to have free access to anywhere that we can. But we also have to be respectful of the fact that we are visitors in foreign countries. We are so lucky to be able to do that by sailboat. And anything that we can do to make it easier to visit these places in a way that is respectful, and you know, following the rules that the people who live there full time are comfortable with, that's really the line that we have to follow. Um, but of course, there are some regulations that have been put in place um, as quite a strong reaction against you know people have fear of you know virus coming in, um, and that's totally understandable. I think it's something we're all slightly afraid of. And um, oh. <laughs> Sorry, my attention's just been grabbed by uh, the owners of another crossbow forty. Arbalest, I remember them. Yes, um, yeah. So uh, sorry, uh, uh, our boat is a crossbow forty. So um, people reaching out who have the same model boat as ours, which is which is nice because there aren't that many of them out in the world. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's an interesting one because um, a guide like this has to be completely informative and. Unbiased as well. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So, um, it we will be coming out with this new edition next year, but it will be interesting to see how much things are changing, both short term and long term, as a result of these restrictions, and you know how movement is going to go. But ultimately, I think the thing to take away is that you know anyone who has a sailboat wants to use it. Anyone who's been stuck at home for a long time might be thinking about getting a sailboat. Um, it's a wonderful way to travel. It's a wonderful way to see, see the world. And, um, you know, we certainly didn't think that we'd still be here nearly nine years later. Um, our, our personal plan was to get on the boat and um, we knew we could financially make it work for a year. Possibly it would be two years. Uh, and you know, all this time later, we're still we're still loving it. We're still really enjoying it. And um, now we have uh, three little tiddlers to uh, keep us occupied. I think they're probably enjoying it as well. Um, they do exist, by the way. I'm not just making them up. They're they're in <laughs> the cabin down uh, in the after, um, actually watching a movie, so that I can have this time talking to you all. Um, yeah, so I'm probably thinking uh, that as my, as my voice is going, <laughs> I'm having to drink more and more tea, um, that might be about it for me, unless you guys have other questions. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I do have a blog, if you would like to follow our adventures more, that's a wonderful thing. It's um, quite easy to remember, 
Um, so I'm going to say it out loud, but I'll also post it on the Emory page as well. It's www.water-log.com. So very easy to remember because it's our C journey. It's water log, water-log.com. And um, from there, you can also link to our Instagram page and our Facebook. And um, all of those get updated very regularly. And um, you can read all sorts of stories that we, um, some that have appeared in, in magazines and um, uh, others which just, you know, are, are wanderings day to day about um, life on board. So, um, yeah, unless there are any other questions, thank you all for joining me. And um, thank you for being here in beautiful Indonesia. You might just be able to get a tiny sound of the call to prayer that's starting outside at the moment. But um, thank you all. And thank you to Imre for inviting me. And it's been really lovely to invite you into our home. Okay. Bye, everyone. Take care.